the best medication that I can give to people costs no money. And that is the understanding that mindfulness and meditation practice can be a very powerful tool. Um, and uh, this costs no money either. So when they say health and wellness costs money, it's expensive, it's for the rich. That's just bogus. That's, it's, it's not true. Before we get into today's episode, I'd like to take a minute to talk about Kion, an awesome company that provides natural supplements and clean coffee for vibrant health. I've been enjoying their delicious coffee, which is in the top 3% of all coffee grown worldwide that can claim to be specialty grade. Their beans are tested by an accredited global organization to ensure that they're free from yeast, pesticides, mold, and mycotoxins. Kion Coffee is ethically sourced, it's roasted to maximize health and flavor, and packaged for freshness. To get 15% off your order of Kion Coffee or any of their products and supplements, visit getkion.com, that's G-E-T-K-I-O-N.com slash Dan Voss, and enter code Dan Voss, that's D-A-N-V-O-S-S, at checkout for 15% off your order. You're listening to the Live Life Longer Show with Dan Voss, where we discuss longevity, anti-aging practices, having more energy, and living a happier, healthier life. My guest today is Dr. Marvin Singh, an integrative gastroenterologist in San Diego, California, and a member of the board and diplomat of the American Board of Integrative Medicine. A graduate of Virginia Commonwealth University School of Medicine, Dr. Singh completed his residency residency training in internal medicine at the University of Michigan Health System, followed by fellowship training in gastroenterology at Scripps Clinic Torrey Pines. Dr. Singh was also trained by Andrew Wheel, MD, a pioneer in the field of integrative medicine at the Andrew Wheel Center for Integrative Medicine. He is dedicated to guiding his clients toward optimal, optimal wellness every step of the way, using the most cutting edge technologies to design highly personalized precision-based protocols and help them stay on top of their health rather than underneath disease. Dr. Marvin Singh, welcome to the Live Life Longer show. Thank you, thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm looking forward to our conversation, getting more into integrative medicine and the approach that you take when it comes to um, looking at health and wellness that I think is is missing in many areas of, of the industry. Um, I definitely see you know significant improvement over the last several years in this space, but if you look back at the past several decades, I think um, a lot of the work that you're doing, it was lost. So I'm happy to see people like yourself uh, taking a new approach, or not necessarily a new approach, because a lot of what you do is, has been around for so long, um, but just kind of reigniting uh, a lot of these concepts. So. Um, With that being said, maybe we can start off uh, you sharing more about yourself in terms of um, what brought you to to medicine, and then uh, maybe tell us a little bit more about that precision health approach that you take to to wellness. Yeah, well, I I think I've always wanted to be a doctor since I was a kid. Um, I tell the story of uh, our sixth grade graduation they made us uh, draw a, a silhouette of our face. I still don't remember how we actually did it because it was pretty accurate, actually, the one that I did. <laughs> I think my parents still have it. And uh, the theme was hopes and dreams. And I wrote on the bottom uh, of the thing, my hopes and dreams are, and then it was dot, 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 everybody had to fill in the blanks. And I said to be a doctor. So I guess from a very early age, um, from elementary school, I, I kind of wanted to help people and, and be a doctor. And so, you know, I guess I, I actually followed that, uh, followed that pathway all the way through. Um, uh, what led me to precision medicine is uh, really a lot longer story. Um, I uh, went through uh, medical school and residency and fellowship and uh, started my first job uh, at Johns Hopkins as a, as a faculty member. And along the ways, when I started practicing, I, I kind of felt that Something was missing from the way that we take care of patients. Um, you know, uh, we were just kind of running through the steps and looking at symptoms and making diagnosis and then making a, you know, treatment plan based on those symptoms and diagnosis. But, you know, we were kind of missing something uh, in the whole picture. And uh, then I discovered uh, Dr. Weil and integrative medicine and 
um, started to learn about that and enrolled in the fellowship and thought that, you know, this may be what the missing piece uh, that uh, I was looking for. And I enrolled in the fellowship and it was like a breath of fresh air blown into my entire body. I really learned a lot about different things, learned about how to look at things from a different perspective and really appreciated um, what health and wellness truly means. And I think it was just one day, uh, as far as precision medicine, I was sitting talking with my wife and we said, I said, you know, wouldn't it be cool if we were able to look at somebody's genes and their microbiome and their sensitivities and their exposures and all of those kind of things and tell them how they should live their life, like what they need to do, mm-hmm. what vitamins they need to be on, how they should exercise, how they should eat and things like that. And I think that's what really, that that's what really sparked the impetus for, um, precision clinic um, uh, and precision medicine. So I started my own practice to do that. And I've experimented on myself a lot. And so um, I, I did a lot of these tests and things on my on myself uh, years ago and uh, started to see a lot of changes. I lost a lot of weight. I started to feel better, energetic, more balanced, more grounded. And I said, damn, this stuff actually does work. Uh, yeah. And so, uh, so there you go. That's the <laughs> long story short in a nutshell, how how I came to do what I'm doing today. That's great. It, it's it's pretty neat when you start discovering new ways of of living and looking at your health. Because um, I've been there too, where you know I, I'm a pretty naturally thin guy, but I've been through periods of my life where I've maybe gained an extra time, like especially during COVID, I gained the quarantine 15, and <laughs> you know you can just see it in your cheeks are a little bit chubbier, or you get a little bit of belly fat, and and it feels weird because again, like I'm a naturally thin guy, and then all of a sudden, like, you know, you wake up and you look in the mirror and you're like, "Who is this guy? What happened?" Um, so it is, it is cool and, and feels really good to, you know, look at your health in, in in a different way and start taking small steps to improve that health, and and then you can look back in the mirror and you're like, "Okay, this is where I should be." <laughs> um, so obviously, you know, all of your patients are, are different. They all have different goals. They may have different, uh, you know, illnesses or diseases or conditions. Um, so of course it's, it's personalized, but can you maybe walk us through some of the steps that you take to access a, a patient's health? Yeah. So, um, there, you know, the sky is the limit with regards to what you want to, or can figure out with your health. Um, the issue uh, is really in discussing with the person how far do you want to go? You know, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, do you want to know uh, about every gene in your genome, or do you want to just kind of focus on health and nutrition? And we look at nutritional genomics, but you know, the basic principles are, you know, we want to not just look at one thing or one aspect. And this is one of the pet peeves I have with uh, some other people or some companies that will come out and say that you need this one thing and you're going to really know your health. You're going to know your wellness. You're going to lose weight if you do this one test. And Mm. that's not how the body works. That's just not how it works. Yes, that one thing might be part of the process, but it is not the process. Right. We have to look at our gut microbiome. We have to look at our genes in some way. Um, it's important to look at mitochondrial health because the mitochondria is a big topic. They're the mm. energy powerhouses of our of our cells, and um, uh, they perform a lot of functions for us. It's important to look at what toxins you're exposed to and and what your sensitivities are because that's kind of the environmental aspect. Yep. It's important to look at your inflammatory markers and other blood markers. Um, and, uh, it's also, uh, helpful to look at, uh, imaging. It's important to, you know, look at what your body composition is. For example, this is a good one is, uh, doing a body composition scan. So, you know, it's one thing to measure your BMI, you know, you're just looking at height and weight there and, and making a calculation. Um, but that's not really as accurate because there is a such thing, uh, called skinny fat, basically, where you may look skinny, but inside you have more fat than you should. And Mm. that's still a risk factor for diabetes and heart disease. And you wouldn't know it or think it because you say, I'm skinny. What's the big deal? You know, that's been me before. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, um, so there's that other level of adding imaging to it. So you're looking at your imaging, you're looking at your genes, you're looking at, you know, your microbiome, you're Mm -hmm. looking at your environmental exposure, you're looking at some 
you know, hormone balance, inflammatory markers. You look at all of those things together. You really can't look at things in isolation. You can't just look at, oh, your mitochondria are imbalanced. Therefore, we need to do these four things and you'll be good. I mean, you're missing, you're missing a lot of the picture there. So yeah. that's what I do. I look at all of these elements together. You know, uh, I get all these results in and I sit down and I may spend hours just analyzing and looking for correlations between all these kind of tests and then come to a conclusion based on that, not based on mm. one observation, but based on multiple observations. Yes. I, everything you just said, I, I'm, I'm smiling right now because it's, <laughs> it's what I've kind of woken up to in the last I would say two years is pretty much everything you just discussed in terms of looking at your microbiome, uh, looking at your mitochondrial health, looking at our environment with, with toxins. You know, these are all things that you might not see on the surface, um, but underneath the surface, it's happening. And, and it's not necessarily overnight. You know, it's, it's happening over years or decades of our lives. Years, right, right. So, I give a snow globe analogy when I when I talk about this kind of stuff often, and, and it's like um, you know you have a snow globe, those snow globes that you can buy and give people mm -hmm. as gifts. Um, uh, let's just say we pick a symptom: abdominal pain. Okay, what's the cause of my abdominal pain? Is it just do an abdominal ultrasound or a CAT scan and you'll find the answer? And if it's negative, then you just have IBS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not right. that simple. Right. Um, uh, the answer to what causes abdominal pain is shake the snow globe and look at all the snowflakes. Mm. All of those things and all those snowflakes and how they interact with each other and how one may push another, how, how it may go in this direction or that direction that's what's causing your abdominal pain. And that's mm. why we can't just look at one snowflake. We have to look at the entire system, what's yeah. happening in the entire system, how those differentiated elements are interacting with each other. And then you can understand the abdominal pain. Yeah, that's such a great analogy. I think it's actually a really good definition of what integrative medicine is. You know, it's, it's a, a makeup of so many different elements. And you can't just look at one thing and put a Band-Aid over it and expect everything to be fixed. It's looking exactly. at the entire puzzle. Um, there's a lot that you, you've discussed I kind of want to go down further here. Um, let's start with microbiome. Uh, what do we need to know about our microbiome in terms of how it impacts our overall health and what we can be doing uh, to improve the health of our microbiome? There's so much. This is a very uh, a continually evolving science. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's probably ne it, uh, not probably it's never going to be done, most yeah. likely, <laughs> because um, there are so many different discoveries being made. And, you know, I think the important thing to understand is the basic principle that there are trillions of microbes, which means bacteria. Mm -hmm. uh, it's actually bacteria, viruses, fungi. So people think it's just bacteria. It's not just bacteria. It's there are other guys there, but bacteria are the main, main action, main guys there. And um, there are trillions of these inside of your digestive tract. They're actually on your skin. They're in your mouth. They're in uh, pro probably every orifice of your body. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, for our purposes, we're talking about the gut because that's, that's the headquarters basically. And these guys make our vitamins, they run our metabolism, they, you know, influence our mood, can influence our uh, sensation of or degree of pain. Mm -hmm. They do so many different things. They create anti-inflammatory things. They can drive inflammation. They can protect us. They can harm us. So, you know, it's all about balance when we, when we find, when we're looking at the microbiome. Um, uh, there are thousands of articles on the microbiome and some may say one thing, some may say the other thing, but at, at the bottom line where everybody agrees is that diversity of the microbiome is a sign of resilience and yep. strength. Mm -hmm. And so that is the, you know, no matter who you are, or where you're from, that's a core principle. And the other core principle to understand is that me and you, we're both humans, we're both men, but our microbiomes are probably only 10 to 20% similar if you hmm. look at it. So if I say, you know, paleo diet is the best diet for everybody, that's just, this has got to be universally wrong right. because how could it be? Because everybody's so different. There are like what, 8 billion plus people on the planet. Yep. And if you say each one is 10 to 20% uh, similar only, that means that there's 80% uh, or so difference between people. Yeah. So 
how could everybody have to eat the same thing? Right. And so this is the biggest farce in health and wellness. When people come and say, you got to, everybody's got to eat the same thing. Um, no, that's, that's just wrong. You know, there is no universal diet, uh, diet, right. diet. I don't even like the word diet. Right. Diet is a diet is just a word we use to describe eating basically, but it's mm -hmm. really an, an, you know, a nutrition plan or an, or an, an eating style, basically, yep. I, I refer to it as often. So are you and a so fan of us, principle. sorry to interrupt you there, are you a fan of us looking at what our ancestors ate and kind of try to replicate that as much as we can in terms of like regions? Um, well, I think, you know, our ancestors also grew up in a different place um, in a different time and in a different environment. Mm -hmm. So that takes us to the next topic uh, with regards to the microbiome. The microbiome changes and shifts with a lot of different influences mm. um where you are living um where what what exposures you have what toxins you have if you imagine let's say 300 years ago your ancestors did they have roundup did they have air pollution like we right. have now did they have um all these other uh, you know flame retardants <laughs> did they yeah. have um, did they have, you know, polysorbate 80 in their food? You know, no. So um, uh, our microbiomes are most likely much different, uh, you know, overall in, in, in the temperament of it, uh, mm -hmm. than it than they than it was back then. True. Perhaps there were even different microbes then uh, that, that, that evolved as well. We don't yeah. I don't know. You know, we weren't sequ sequencing microbiomes of Iceman, you know, <laughs> so. <True. laughs> So, you know, um, there are a lot of things that influence the microbiome. So you were also asking. So a diet is one that we talk about a lot. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes that's the only thing we talk about. Um, but yeah. uh, that's actually not the only thing. There are a lot of things like exercise, ba very mm -hmm. basic things that you think are, are just overly basic, but there's not. Right. There, there's a lot of literature showing that exercise, sleep habits, your exposure to toxins, the, how, mu how much stress you have, and even your your living environment how much mm -hmm. uh you know social cohesion you have in your neighborhoods they 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 have seen that these factors can actually influence the balance of your microbiome so yeah. our microbiome is like the antenna uh on our head if we were an ant walking around right it's really our our sensory organ as well in, in a sense because if something's happening, they may shift to try to adapt to that situation. In a way, that's a good thing because we don't die if we, you know, accidentally are exposed to Roundup. But mm -hmm. um, uh, if it happens continually, then things just go awry. You know, it's it's sure. it's only so good uh, if you if you keep beating it up over and over again, then then it may start working against you. What is it about exercise? Because I know you mentioned exercise and other things like um, a healthy social life. Mm -hmm. What is it that uh, impacts our, our gut health when it comes to exercise and, and social aspect? So they've done a lot of studies actually showing that uh, people who exercise, athletes, have a more diverse microbiome. Mm. It's interesting. Um, yeah. So the microbiome response to that um, uh, and this may also help drive reduction in body fat and uh, improve your metabolism. Mm -hmm. So when we say go exercise, it's good for you. You lose weight. That that's kind of like what what peop most people think. I I you know, and that that's still the truth. But I'm the I'm the kind of guy who asks, well, why? What what's actually happening? What where is that coming from? Yep. And um, uh, this is one of the ways the microbiome yep. is is responsible for that. And exactly how everything happens and how uh, everything occurs is still being worked out. But the the next key concept is uh, in what we call metabolites. Mm. So it's one thing to say you have a microbe or a bacteria, and then you want to look at what is that bacteria actually doing? What is it releasing? What is it making? And this is the metabolite, mm -hmm. kind of the same concept of, you know, COVID is a fresh topic and the COVID vaccine is a fresh topic. So the COVID vaccine is a RNA. It's, it's the genetic material to make spike protein. And so you have that genetic material and then you produce a spike protein. So you can kind of think of it, um, it's, it's an improper analogy technically, but just to make the point, mm -hmm. you can think of 
the spike protein that the that the um, that the vaccine makes as the metabolite. It's it's the okay. product that that is made by the gene, mm -hmm. and so um, the bacteria also have genes, right? They have to. Right. Uh, the gene, you know, DNA is is the is the thing of life. Yep. And so, um, if think about if there are like a hundred trillion bacteria in your gut. And all of those guys have genes. Mm. That's a lot of genes, yeah. right? That's a lot of genes. So, um, for example, um, these guys may uh, eat fiber and then produce short chain fatty acids. Butyrate, for example, is a famous metabolite. Mm -hmm. So, these are the things that can actually influence our health. So, the bacteria are there, the bacteria make or produce something. That chemical then is now in our body, in our bloodstream, and can go to different places in our body and influence health at that level, mm. like a medicine almost. Like yep. you take a medicine and it does the same thing. And so this is probably how we're, this is going to be the next iteration or next understanding of the microbiome. We'll probably be talking more about metabolites from the microbiome than the actual microbiome itself. Um, this is probably where it's going to go because... That's where the answers to a lot of things come from. Yeah. Uh, in terms of testing, what would what is available for someone that's listening that wants to maybe have a gut microbiome testing done or food sensitivity mm -hmm. testing done? Um, what can you tell us there? Gut microbiome testing is a, is a fun topic to talk about too. <laughs> um, uh, there's a lot of misconceptions on what a gut microbiome test actually is or okay. what it means. You know, you, there's a ton of stool tests you can get out there. Yeah. Um, and just because you do a stool test and they give you a list of 25 different, you know, microorganisms and what their balance or imbalance is, does not make a microbiome test. Mm. If there are 100 trillion in your gut and you get a list of 25, how in the world is that reflective of what's going on, right? Right. So I'm, I'm kind of a purist when it comes to that. And I guess I have to be because I'm an integrative gastroenterologist. <laughs> um, uh, we want to look at what's going on in the entire system. And uh, there's so many different variations of microbial patterns that you might find between any individual. So and, and, you know, I may be a microbiome guy, I may be a precision medicine guy, mm -hmm. but there is no way on earth that I or any human could be expected to know trillions of different bacteria and, and what all of them do. Sure. That's why we have AI driving the, the you know, results reporting behind a lot of these, uh, you know, tests. Mm -hmm. Um, but the key point is not so much, and my thought process has changed over the last few years too. You know, it's not like I was born thinking this way, but, um, the main idea is not really to fixate on this microbe or that microbe, mm -hmm. because at the end of the day, like we were talking about metabolites, you don't know what that microbe good or bad is actually doing. True. Is he dormant? Is he making stuff? Is he making what you think he's making or what you presume he's making based on studies on that, on that microbe? Yep. I don't know. We don't know. Right. Unless you're looking at that specifically. So, you know, fixating on, you know, uh, you get a list and you're like, oh, I have this bacteria. This is a bad guy because it. I look at all the stuff online and it says da 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 da. So I need to do da 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 da. That, that's not the way to look at it. You can look at the guys. You can say bad guy, good guy. I understand, you know, I have more of these, less of these. What's more important is, okay, so what's the net effect? What's happening in your microbiome, good or bad? Is there inflammation happening? Is there diversity? Is there resiliency? Um, are, are the microbes, uh, do you have in the, in the microbiome, do you have enough capacity to make your short chain fatty acids, make your right. vitamins, things like that? Because at the end of the day, that's all we really want to know. That's all mm -hmm. we really care about. So I look at things from a very global perspective as far as that, because then you can really understand best what to do to support the microbiome. Mm, yeah, that makes sense. You mentioned earlier the, um, the importance of our mitochondrial health. Uh, what can you tell us about mitochondria and why it's important to our overall wellness? Um, this is a great topic too. It's a, it's a topic that's coming out these days as well. Um, mm -hmm. And the mitochondria are um, really energy powerhouses for our cells mm -hmm. and they're in every cell in our body. And um, uh, historically, you know, they are actually ancient bacteria that somehow evolves to become part of our bodies as well. Yeah. Um, and so 
um, a lot of people that have uh, health issues may have dysfunction in the mitochondria because dysfunction in the mitochondria means dysfunction in the cells and mm -hmm. the cells are, you know, they're, they're the basic building block of us, you know? And so by supporting the functions of the mitochondria, we can help uh, our cells function better, which may help our overall symptoms. And, you know, it, dep it depends on what um, problem you actually have uh, as far as what predictions could be made with regards to how you're dysfunctional. But sometimes people have um, a dysfunction in the electron transport chain. This is very science heavy when you start yeah. talking about mitochondria. Right. And that's, you know, how the electrons are transported um, from um, uh, one part to the other part. Um, mm -hmm. And you can support that. Um, and uh, sometimes you see you know, uh, very high levels of mitochondria being cranked out and you say, Hey, that's great. I have mitochondria, that, but that's, that's not, that's not necessarily great because that means that your body is compensating for a problem. Mm. You have an, a viral infection or you have some, some, something else going on in your body. And as a result, there's compensation. The body's funny like that when there's uh, suppression or less, uh, amount of something mm -hmm. in order to help create that balance it will make more mm. to try to offset the deficiency. Interesting. Um, so the body, the body is designed to be in homeostasis. That's what, where the body wants to be. Um, just like in thyroid disease, for example, if your thyroid levels are low, what happens? The TSH goes up because the, the body wants to make more hormone to offset the balance because you're deficient. Mm -hmm. So this is, this is how the mitochondria work as well too. So this yeah. is an element that I look at uh, when, when we're looking at people's health. It's super interesting. Do you have any um, like specific uh, uh, steps or ideas that we can implement into our lifestyle to improve our mitochondrial health? Yeah, very, very simple things. I actually had a mitochondrial expert on my podcast um, nice. uh, talking about some of these things and um, uh, you know, just exercising, sleeping mm -hmm. well, hydrating, mm -hmm. eating proper nutrition. These are, these are very basic things that actually help support mitochondrial health. Yeah. I had, um, Dr. Jerry Pollack on my podcast a few months back. He, uh, discovered the fourth phase of water, easy water. So he was getting into mitochondria quite a bit and, uh, and he was talking about earthing and, mm -hmm. uh, I actually just in the last week to prep for our conversation here. I was listening to, um, I think it was a super humanized podcast that you were on recently and you guys talked about mm -hmm. earthing. And, and when I was listening to it, I remember just like stopping whatever I was doing. And I was just like, yes, they're talking about earthing. Cause that is something I practice <laughs> and, um, just fascinated by, by the science of it. Can you tell us a little bit maybe, more maybe, about maybe, maybe that, maybe that cues into the ancient, um, bacteria's uh senses or feelings that it wants to be back home who knows <laughs> exactly i I, th I think you're onto something there um can you tell us more about about earthing and why it's important for our health um well earthing earthing means basically you know uh being out in nature and connecting with nature um uh, most of the times people are walking in their barefoot that's how they think about, about it uh mm -hmm. you know get feed in the soil or feed in the sand or whatever um and um you know, it's it's one way of connecting to our environment. And like I was, we were talking about earlier. Yeah, you know, the environment is a very important component of our health and wellness. And by earthing, we're connecting with the environment. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I don't know if we understand all the hundred percent science behind all of it, but you know, uh, all of our electrons and you know, in our body are connecting to the earth and environment around us. And uh, we do have studies clinically showing that this helps reduce inflammatory markers and stress and anxiety. Um, there's actually some, uh, there's actually one cool study. I think I remember um, they took people and had them set on, on a bench in the, like in the middle of a forest and, and then in a, um, in the city setting, you know, mm -hmm. um, and, uh, it was actually pretty profound that, you know, it, levels of stress or inflammatory response um, yeah. was uh, definitely notable uh, when people were in the more forest um, environment. Right. And um, so this is a great way, you know, and, and uh, with regards to that, uh, one of the concepts of mindfulness is that, you know, our minds 
where do you think your mind is when you say, where's my mind? You know, I'm losing my mind. Where's your mind? Your mind, most people say, my mind is up here. My mind's in my head. Mm -hmm. That's actually not entirely true. Your mind um, is within you and between you and mm. your environment. Um, so right now, your mind and my mind, we're, we're both, you know, in our bodies, but it's actually over zoom here it's it's between yeah. us as well our minds are interacting with each other and our minds interact with the environment and this is uh really the philosophy and teachings of uh dr dan siegel who's uh one of the mindfulness teachers that i really follow uh very closely he's a friend of mine and mm. uh he's written a lot of books on the topic and uh i think it's really important to understand and appreciate the connection or interconnection between us as humans and our environment. Um, I love that outlook. It's very important. I love that outlook with mindfulness. If you just take this example, this conversation, for example, you know, we've been talking here for I don't know, a little over half hour through Zoom on our laptops. I am only focused on you and nothing else going on around me other than when my puppy walked down earlier in the conversation. <laughs> um, but that example of the mind being within us, but also between us, I think is it's spot on when it comes to mindfulness. And Dr. Siegel can... says there's no me and there's no we. It's mui, M-W-E. <laughs> I like it. I like that. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been finding a lot of peace um, in nature. And the thing that I am enjoying about it so much is that, you know, in our 21st century, our modern world, technology is a beautiful thing, but um, it can also be a, a very dangerous thing and something that we overuse and constantly on screens and uh you know surrounded by emfs everywhere and i think that's the beauty of it is that you can get back out to nature and reconnect with nature and it studies have are showing so many different health benefits um okay. very good i also kind of on that same note of um like maybe reconnecting we did talk a little bit about social aspect um and i don't know if we had a chance to kind of dive into that a little bit further um especially in today's world during COVID where people mm -hmm. are struggling to, to connect with people. I mean, of, of course we have technology, which to my point, technology can be a beautiful thing when you use it for things like this or FaceTiming uh, a relative that's, you know, on the other side of the country or other side of the world. Um, why is social, uh, social life so important for our health? We are social beings. I mean, this is just in our programming as, as, animals basically yeah. this is this is who we are as humans um i think the important thing to underscore is that you don't need a hundred friends to get the job done really mm. yep. really you just need one person they don't even have to really be what you consider a family member or a friend it could be a teacher it could be a social worker it could be you know your next door neighbor you know it could be a friend it could be a distant cousin it could be mm. anybody but if, if those people, you know, if you have at least one person, somebody you can talk to, somebody you can, you know, uh, um, get some advice from, you just have at least one person in your life that you can talk to on that level, then that's helpful. There are studies, you know, suggesting that people who um, have meaningful relationships may actually live longer, mm -hmm. have less risk of chronic disease and and to have better health outcomes when they do have a problem, such as cancer, for example. And that person could even be your doctor, by the way, too. Mm. Um, there's, there are, you know, a lot of the studies when you're looking at interactions um, are doctor-patient interaction studies, and um, they, you know, uh, in the setting of cancer, and some of the studies suggest that those uh, patients who have cancer who have a good relationship with their oncologist actually have better outcomes uh, mm -hmm. as a result of that doctor-patient relationship. And there are some interesting studies if you look at the microbiome um, uh, and there are studies that uh, suggest that those who live in neighborhoods, um, uh, you know, uh, eliminating for uh, other confounding factors, those who live in neighborhoods where the social cohesiveness is better um, uh, uh, may have more diverse microbiomes. Wow. So it's very interesting finding to see that as well. Because, you know, there are a lot of things that play into um, the composition of the microbiome, but stress is one of them, too. So perhaps, you know, if you're if you're living in an area where 
you're always stressed out. There's nobody to rely on. That that could be what's causing the imbalance, you yep. know, and and it could be a factor of where you live um, that's driving that stress. Mm. And um, interestingly enough, uh, if you correlate with uh, data on the telomeres, which are you know, the caps at the end of our chromosomes mm -hmm. um, that uh, are kind of a factor uh, with regards to longevity and your overall health status. Um, they suggest that, you know, uh, for example, with kids that are in, um, you know, tough environments, that uh, one of the things to help improve their telomere health would be to remove them from these tough environments. So, wow. um, so there's a lot of correlations. The body responds in many different ways to the same things. Mm. So I have a slide on one of my presentations that I give that, you know, gut health equals DNA health equals brain health equals whole health, mm. you know, because th these are all the same concepts. I could give a lecture on longevity and talk about some of the same things. I could give a lecture on gut health and the same things might come up. You know, we can give a lecture on hormone balance and the same things might come up. So why don't we just start doing the same things? Because yeah. a lot of these same things are, are actually, they don't cost you anything, you know, yep. sleeping the right amount, you know, you know, eating is the only thing that really costs you money, but you're going to eat anyway. So you might as well use that money on the right things rather right. than the wrong things. Um, and if you have to invest in, in, in pay for a little bit better food, then you're investing in your future. So you don't have to, you know, spend money on too many medications later on in life as mm -hmm. well. You know, exercise doesn't really cost money. People complaining about they have to go to the gym and I don't have my gym membership and all that kind of stuff. That, that's just an excuse. You can mm. exercise with nothing, you know, do yeah. some sit-ups or push-ups. All you need is a surface on the floor to do exercise, you know. Um, exactly. You know, and, and reduction of stress. The best medication that I can give to people costs no money. And that is the understanding that mindfulness and meditation practice can be a very powerful tool. Mm. Um, and uh, this costs no money either. So when they say health and wellness costs money, it's expensive, it's for the rich. That's just bogus. That's, it's, it's not true. Yep. Yes. I mean, if you want to do these tests, um, you know, you can look at your budget and decide how much money you want to spend on doing tests. You can accomplish similar goals by focusing on particular areas. Um, if you want to do everything, you can do everything. Just like if you want to buy a Ferrari, you can buy a Ferrari, but that doesn't mean you have to buy a Ferrari. Honda works just as well, you know, and, and I don't work for Honda either. So I'm not promoting <laughs> Honda, I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> but, you know, um, you know, you, you uh, everybody can do different things and accomplish things in, in their own way, but you don't have to be afraid of those barriers or those perceived barriers um, to, to get started in, in owning your health. Oh man, mic drop. I think everything you just said there, we're done here. I, I don't even need to re, uh, <laughs> keep my, my podcast going here. I think everything you just said <laughs> sums up entirely what uh, I'm trying to accomplish with my podcast is that, you know, health is uh, interconnected and that's, that's what I've been so fascinated by. Uh, with all the conversations I'm having with people like yourself is I'm learning how much everything in health is interconnected. I love that you talked about um, the, you know, the myths of health being expensive and you kind of just, you know, debunked all of those myths that uh, nutrition is, you know, eating well is expensive. Sure. It might be a little bit higher price point than going through the drive through of McDonald's, but wouldn't you rather pay a little bit more? And I'm talking about like a little bit more upfront uh, and, and have a healthy lifestyle and, and live well rather than eating junk all your life. And then, you know, later on you have all these diseases that, that pop up and now you're having surgeries and medical bills and by the way, like yeah, that. co pays and deductibles, they're yep. cash coming out of your pocket too. So exactly, you know, uh, I pay, I pay, I don't know. I did, you know, between me and my employer, I think, um, the health insurance costs me like thirty thousand dollars a year or something like that yep. and then when you want to go get a cbc done you still get a bill yep <laughs> what's wild. the point what are, you know so it's really a it's really a kind of a sense of you just got to understand what are you actually doing mm -hmm. so on one hand um you know people will say well i don't want to i don't want to pay for a food sensitivity test because two hundred dollars 
But, uh, you know, if you're eating improperly and going to the doctor a hundred times over that problem, yep. you're spending well over $200 on that, Exactly. You know, where you could try to get to the root of your problem on one shot and then be done with it. Exactly. It's and a frame of thing. mind, really. I think people think that, you know, we have health insurance and we should be using health insurance and you should, you know, and I, mm -hmm. and I am a huge advocate of using the health insurance because you're paying sure. for it. But this is not, we, we don't have socialized medicine here. Right. Um, so you're still paying for it one way or the other, you know, yeah. and you're paying for it out of your income, by the way, too. So it's not like it's free, you know. Exactly. It's so true. And the other thing we haven't talked about, uh, this is a topic for another time, um, but fasting, you know, that's free and, mm -hmm. and it actually saves you money because, you know, now yeah, I do time restricted fasting. <laughs> I eat two meals a day and, uh, you know, that's one less meal I have to pay for every day. Um, yeah. so that's the other thing is, is I think that what we're getting at here is there's a lot of information out there that, um, is misconstrued or, or people just have the wrong idea of, of what health can be in terms of affordability and personalization. So I appreciate you bringing all of that to light. Um, I also understand you have a book that's, uh, to be released at some point this year. Maybe you want to yeah. spend a few minutes talking about that. Yeah, well, my book is really uh, talking about a lot of the stuff we've talked about here today. And actually, the title of the book is called Own Your Health. Nice. And it's really, um, uh, uh, hopefully, going to be a great tool for people to understand um, how they can kind of get in control of their health, how they mm. can take certain steps to kind of being the CEO of their body and controlling their health. And uh, really explaining how precision medicine is really a game changer. It's really mm -hmm. the next generation of healthcare, looking at yourself and understanding what you need to do for your health based on your risks, not mm -hmm. looking at what, you know, this group of people who follow this guy's blog are doing and trying to apply that to your, you know, health plan, because that's what a lot of people do these days. Yep. Oh, oh, this guy has this many followers and people are agreeing with him. So it must be good. So I'm going to do that, too. Right. That's, that, talk about science. That's just total bogus. That, 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 that's there's no rationale to following that by any means. Right. So, you know, it's it's very important to understand who you are, what's inside of you, what what your body needs. And then do that because my philosophy is that if you give your body the ingredients that it needs to do the job that it wants to do, then it will do the best that it can under your circumstances. And that really is what precisionomics means. Precisionomics is just the name that I gave to this style or method of looking into your health. It's really focusing in on you and understanding what you need to do. And mm -hmm. this book is going to be a great tool for people, everybody. It doesn't matter, you know, who you are, or where you live or, or where you came from. Uh, there, there are going to be recommendations there to help you understand how to get on track. It sounds like an awesome book. Uh, everything that I'm excited about in terms of health and what we need to be focusing on. So um, if you're up for it, whenever that book is released, I'd love to have you back on and maybe we can get into some more of the, sure. the nitty gritty details of the content. For there. sure. Um, where can people find more about you and, and learn more about your work? Yeah, my website is called precisionclinic.com, precision with an E. Um, we spell it on purpose the Italian way, um, uh, the word <laughs> precision, because um, they have an E at the end. And I like the play on words, the O-N-E means because we're focusing on you, the one person. Nice. So precisionclinic.com, all our contact information is there. Um, and uh, uh, anybody can feel free to reach out. I see patients all over the world, actually. That's awesome. Well, Dr. Singh, this has been a pleasure speaking with you. I, I appreciate your approach. Um, as I've mentioned before, it's, it's, it's all interconnected. And I think it's an approach that we need to be focusing on more of, especially in today's modern world where we get so caught up in, in so many different things and we don't realize what's going on underneath the surface. So I appreciate you bringing a lot of these issues to light. So thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. And uh, I hope you, have, hope you have a great day. You too. Thanks.